The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Dear all, welcome to this very first webinar in the IPBS webinar series, delivered to you by the IPBS Task Force and Technical Support Unit on Capacity Building. Thank you so much for joining us. Through the IPBS webinar series, we offer webinar sessions aiming to build capacities for those involved in and wanting to learn more about IPBS. A further 10 webinars have been tentatively planned as part of the series during 2016. In that regard, I am happy to announce that Professor Sandra Diaz will join us for, the, for our next webinar, which will take place Thursday, 28th of April at 6 to 7 p.m. Central European Summer Time. She will present and answer questions related to the IPBS conceptual framework. Detailed information about upcoming sessions, including date and time, presenter, abstract, and a registration link will be posted in the IPBS events calendar on ipbs.net. Notifications will also be sent through our network via email. Recordings of all webinar sessions, including this first webinar, will be made available on ipbs.net. In today's webinar, we are partnered by Mr. Ivai Baste, IPBS Bureau Member and Co-Chair of the Capacity Building Task Force, who will present on the IPBS assessment process. Before continuing to the presentation, I have a few points on housekeeping for today's session. We will not interrupt the presentation for questions, but we will have a facilitated Q&A session in the second half of the webinar. If you have any questions you would like to ask, you can submit these during the presentation using the toolbar facility at the side of your screen. If you are experiencing technical issues, you can also submit them here. If you, after this webinar, have any questions regarding the IPBS webinar series or the work of the IPBS Task Force and Technical Support Unit on Capacity Building, please feel free to send us your comments via email to tsu.capacitybuilding at ipbs.net. As this is the first webinar of the IPBS webinar series, we appreciate your input on how it can be developed in the future. To that end, you will be prompted to answer a brief two-minute survey once the webinar ends. We rely, we rely on your input to identify key topics for upcoming webinars. I will now hand over to our presenter to begin today's session on the IPBS assessment process. We really look forward to this presentation and I hope all of you listening in find the session both interesting and useful. Okay, over to you, Ivai. Thank you very, very much, uh, Håkon, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, or maybe even good night. Um, it's really, it's really great, really, really great to, to and uh, it's, uh, it's really great to have you online, and um, I'm really grateful that you've taken time to join us. Um, I guess we have a little bit of a mix of, of uh, participants uh, in the webinar, uh, both of uh, people who are quite familiar with IPES, people who are working as authors on, on IPES, and others who'd like to sort of learn more about uh, the IPES assessment process. So I thought I'd start basically by going a little bit sort of back to, to first principles so that uh, we try to sort of um, keep our um, uh, mind focused on, on sort of where we, we're coming from initially um, and that's just to sort of recall the establishment of IPES uh, which took place in, in, in uh, 2012 um, and perhaps also recall the, the main objective of, of IPES which is to strengthen the science policy interface for biodiversity and ecosystem services for the conservation and sustainable use of uh, biodiversity and for the long-term human well-being and sustainable development. So it's, it's quite a mouthful, but I think the, the, the key notion here is really uh, to, to strengthen the science policy interface. So right now we have some 120 plus governments that are members, we have a number of observers um, of this body, which is really a, an independent body, independent even of the, the UN system, um, and of a non-legally binding nature, uh, but administered uh, by uh, the UN, notably the United Nations Environment Programme, and with support from um, three other main UN entities, the Development Programme, the UN. NDP 
the FAO on food and agriculture and UNESCO on the uh, education, science and culture. Uh, so it's, it's uh, firmly anchored uh, in the international arena uh, but really has an independent stature and status. So if we were to look at sort of the role of assessment then in um, in the IPES, it is actually one of the, the, the key functions in the science policy interface. Um, and um, if we are looking at the sort of application of the assessments uh, within uh, IPES, what we're really looking at is the sort of the interaction between nature and society, between biodiversity and society, between kind of environment and, and development. Uh, that is really the, the, the focus of, of, of IPES. Uh, and it uh, does so by looking at it at a sort of multi-scale. Um, it comes from it at an international sort of global perspective, but it looks uh, looks at the issue sort of towards the regional uh, dimension and uh, and all the way uh, to the to the to the national and, and local level in principle now uh, another sort of so dimension we're looking at and that, that we really need to sort of keep in mind uh, when we do assessment is the is the scale dimension uh, time dimension um, in addition to the scale dimension uh, and basically that is uh, taking uh, note of sort of what are the trends uh, in this interaction between nature and biodiversity we're looking at and also what are the future possible projections, what are the scenarios. Um, so we're looking at, uh, we're kind of placed in a, in a, in a four-dimensional uh, space here. But uh, the assessment function is not the only function of IPES. Uh, it, uh, IPES is also um, has among its functions to, to stimulate uh, knowledge generation and work with the knowledge generation community, not only the science community but also different knowledge systems such as those uh, held by local and indigenous communities. Um, and furthermore, IPES is there to support policy, uh, notably by uh, providing policy relevant information but also by um, uh, trying to stimulate the development of, of policy support tools. Furthermore, uh, there's a very strong recognition in uh, IPES that um, there are some severe asymmetries in terms of capacities around the world. So the fourth function of IPES is really to build capacity within uh, those four functions, including in the assessment function of IPES, but also to uh, facilitate capacity building um, beyond that uh, by working with partners. But I will not go much into that uh, in, in, this, uh, in this presentation. I will sort of basically focus on the assessment function and how IPES is undertaking uh, different uh, assessments. So if we're looking at uh, the IPES assessments in a, in a nutshell, um, it's, it's really what IPES is trying to do is to critically assess the state of knowledge on the interactions that we talked about between the human societies and the natural world uh, and doing some fr from an international perspective. So, and the different analysis that um, would uh, typically sort of uh, involve um, in-kind contributions from hundreds of leading experts uh, from multiple disciplines in science as well, from, as, well as from indigenous and, and local uh, knowledge systems. And uh, the involvement of these sort of experts world around from different parts of the world, uh, they really follow a rigorous, rigorous process uh, which in essence um, is put in place to help the world separate facts from fiction in their biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, and it just does that through uh, different aspects of the of the process, and we'll we'll try to look a bit at, at that in more in more detail. Um, but a key thing uh, for IPES, uh, as it is for the IPCC, the uh, the the UN's uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is also to present the the confidence level of the finding um, and to make sure that the findings are uh, policy re relevant um, and, and support both policy making and, and future knowledge generation. So if we have to sort of look a little bit about uh, at sort of what is really governing the IPES assessment, uh, then um, it's almost like we need to go a little bit back to the, uh, 
to the to the IPES constitutions. So we looked at what the, the overall goal of, of IPES is in terms of strengthening the science policy interface. Uh, we have looked at the functions, but IPES also has a series of operating principles, um, which amongst others speak to the need for the IPES operations to be credible, to be relevant and, and, and legitimate, and a lot of the processes uh, which uh, steer and guide the assessment processes have those sort of three um, those three principles as key benchmarks. Credibility, relevance, and legitimacy is really critical to the IPES assessment process. Um, other uh, principles is the need to ensure scientific independence. Uh, it's a need to make sure that it's open and transparent processes that involve a number of stakeholders. Uh, there's a need to also uh, attend to the to, to gender issues, uh, to facilitate cooperation, to make sure that what IPES is doing is actually building on what is out there from before and not sort of reinventing um, uh, processes. There is a lot of work already taking place in the science policy interface on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Now, uh, another key um, sort of aspect of the governance of IPES assessments is the institutional arrangements, which is also kind of to a large extent set out in the in the sort of IPES constitution, if one might call it that, from Panama, the, the, the document that really established IPES in 2012. So first of all, this is, is the overarching um, body of, of, uh, of IPES, which is the plenary. Um, which we looked at is some 120 governments uh, and and observers. So typically, a plenary meeting would be several hundred, if not close to thousand uh, participants. There's a small bureau of 10 people, uh, two from each region. There is an expert group, a multidisciplinary expert panel, uh, with five members from each region, and uh, there is a small secretariat of some 15 staff members. There are numerous expert groups that currently are involving some thousand experts around the world, and there are technical support units which are to some extent funded by IPES, but also include a lot of in-kind contributions from uh, several institutions around the world which are supporting these different expert groups, be they task forces or author groups of assessments. So basically what we're looking at in the institutional arrangement is a, a very small in institution in terms of, of a secretariat, but a, a rather large institution in terms of network, a network of experts and, and expert institutions which are to a huge extent contributing to the endeavors of IPES uh, in kind. And the way of making sure that such a big cohort of, of experts actually work in tandem is to have proper governance tools in place. So uh, to the uh, to the uh, right hand side of the slide I've sort of tried to list a few of those key tools. Uh, and first of all is, is actually the rules of procedures for the plenary because since IPES is an independent body, it needs, uh, it needs its own uh, rules of procedure that governs uh, uh, everything that the, the, the plenary does. So that doesn't really affect the sort of assessment processes that much. It's really more uh, about uh, Conduct the so the conduct of business by the plenary. Uh, the next one is is a work program which has been approved by the plenary for uh, the period 2014-2018, and that is also quite a sort of important uh, um, anchor for many of the assessments. Uh, of IPES, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit uh, later, um, because a number of the assessments are really already sort of in principle uh, set out as uh, possible deliverables of IPES in the work program. That doesn't, however, necessarily mean that they uh, automatically are initiated or implemented, that requires an active decision by the plenary. Uh, the, this, then the assessments are really then um, funded by the trust fund to some extent, but also highly dependent on in-kind contributions from, from experts and from institutions around the world. 
a really key document for the governing the IPES assessments is the procedures for the preparation of platform deliverables. It's a 40-page document uh, drawing quite to some extent on the, on the procedures uh, by the IPCC, but it also has the, its own uh, its own peculiarities in terms of sort of attending to IPES specific matters, and there are some some differences between IPES and IPCC. But what it really does is to a large extent lay out sort of the process for scoping, the process for expert selection, preparation, review, approval of assessments, use of indigenous and local knowledge, how to address errors uh, if they were to um, occur, um, and how to address is issues um, related to conflict of interest, uh, which is really important in, 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 in an institution which builds on uh, uh, so many um, inputs from so many different uh, uh, experts and from, from different institutions. Um, another uh, key document for the assessments is the conceptual framework, which sets out uh, the sort of analytical approach uh, for the IPES uh, assessments and analysis. Um, furthermore, there are uh, a few uh, guidelines already in place. So, even though it has, has only been in existence for a, a couple of years, or at least uh, um, the implementation of the program has just been going on for a couple of years. Uh, so there's one on, on assessments, and that really sort of brings together a lot of the elements also from the procedures. Uh, there's one uh, on scenarios coming uh, from uh, stemming from also a separate uh, assessment on scenarios. There is one already on, on valuation, um, and there, there is a catalog on assessment. There is one also on in development on policy support tools. So there, there are a number of tools uh, here which are uh, important for the governance of the uh, IPES uh, assessments. And uh, basically, what I will try to do is to, to um, point to the guideline uh, on assessments. But before that, I'll just sort of point to the conceptual framework because that is also quite important for the, for the analysis that will be taking place in the different assessments. But I will um, uh, actually, well, I'll revert to the, to the conceptual framework a little bit later. I'll actually first have a look at the assessment guide. Um, so the assessment guide is, is really a quite a large chunk of, 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 uh, of information. It's some 150 pages. First of all, it sets out uh, an introduction, sort of what is it, is what's an IPES assessment, how do you use this guide? I think we've already alluded to a few of those um, questions, especially what IPES is. Um, the second uh, sort of main part, the section one, really is addressing the conceptual issues. It looks at uh, the IPES conceptual framework, how to use it, and looks at the IPES assessment across gates in, in the sort of conceptual uh, in, uh, the sort of conceptual approach for doing that, the multi-scale and multi-scale approach. Section two is really about applying the IPES assessment process. It's the IPES assessment process is using confidence terms or two sort of main chapters there. Section three is really about the use of methodologies in assessment. So that is about uh, values, it's about the role of scenarios and models, it's about indigenous and local knowledge, it's about data uh, knowledge, information data uh, gaps, it's about indicators a lot of the sort of supportive activities um, of IPES in terms of assessment, so it's, it's really important for the assessment. Um, and then section five is, uh, should actually be uh, four, but uh, it appears to be five here, uh, enhancing the utility of assessments for decision makers and practitioners. Um, it looks at uh, policy support tools and methodologies. It looks at communication uh, stakeholder engagement. And then the last part is really about capacity building and how to strengthen capacities uh, in the science policy interface. And, and this guide also includes uh, a glossary. Um, the guide is uh, available online, and there is uh, actually, uh, if you click on the uh, on the top here, then then uh, one should be able to to ac access the guide. Um, I'll uh, basically, uh, yeah. So this is the this, this is the uh, the the the, uh, um, the link. Now. Um, 
I will basically now focus on the use of, um, uh, of applying the IPNES assessment process in Section 2. But before doing so, as I promised, I'll sort of just say one or two words about uh, the conceptual framework. And that is really, um, if I can uh, make uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, slide, uh, here we are. So the conceptual framework um, is um, something, one of the first, basically first things that were developed by the, uh, by IPES. Um, it, it, it is really spelled out in, in chapter one in the in the guide. Uh, we have also uh, put in here a link to the to the, an article uh, uh, which also uh, explains the conceptual framework, a scientific article. There is also an e-learning tool being developed. There is a link to that uh, tool as well. It's been developed uh, by the Sub Global Assessment uh, Network, which is uh, uh, hosted by the. Uh, as mentioned by Malcolm, there will be a, a webinar series um, uh, number two, where uh, Sandra Diaz, uh, who is one of the uh, MET members who have uh, taken a lead on the development of the conceptual framework, will present the conceptual framework more in detail. So this is just a note that, and in this uh, framework is is where we're looking at uh, sort of what are the main components in the science uh, in the in the nature. Uh, society interactions, looking at it from uh, how it's changing over time, how it's uh, uh, how it's inter in, uh, interacting uh, across spatial scales, um, with a focus obviously on of IPES at an international level, but also with uh, IPES trying to go down to a, a lower level resolution, um, closer to national and, and, and local level. Uh, but I will sort of basically skip this. Uh, skip this um, for now, other than saying that the uh, framework is not really a, a straitjacket, but it's more like a scaffolding trying to uh, put some order in the uh, approach of analyzing these interactions between the society and, and nature. So basically, well, if you're looking at the best assessments, there are, there are four uh, key types of assessments. It's the global assessments, which um, IPES in uh, its latest plenary um, in Kuala Lumpur uh, last week of February uh, initiated the very first assessment to be completed in 2019. Uh, IPES also have um, an approach to regional assessments um, and there are currently four ongoing for Africa, America, Asia, and the Pacific, and Europe and Central Asia, and they are scheduled to be finalized in 2017. Then um, the third um, kind of assessment is the thematic assessments, and IPES have just uh, finalized its uh, assessment on pollinators, pollination, and food production. It's really have been uh, uh, an assessment which have tested many of the um, IPAS processes and uh, methodologies and has also led to uh, the need to adjust uh, some of the processes uh, a bit. Um, it's kind of been a, a, a guinea pig in, in, in this um, uh, respect. Then there is another assessment going on currently on land degradation and restoration, which will be completed in 2017. Uh, and there are some uh, planned and scoped, one on invasive species, but has not been initiated uh, yet, and one on sustainable use, which is uh, uh, currently being rescoped. Um, in addition, um, IPES in its procedures also ha are catering for not only sort of standard uh, and a standard approach to thematic and methodological assessment, but also a fast track approach. Um, it hasn't really sort of used that uh, approach fully because uh, of um, some concern over the process shortcutting um, the review uh, stage. Uh, I don't want to go too much into to the detail, but I think it's important for us to to know that at least the procedures cater for uh, different uh, some different approaches here. Um, then the IPES procedures also are not 
only talking about sort of uh, standard assessments. Um, it's also possible to develop synthesis reports focusing on specific issues on in, within an assessment. It's uh, possible to produce technical papers, other supported material that can be uh, produced by IPES. IPES. And then finally, uh, IPES also uh, supports capacity building for carrying out and using national and regional assessments. So the IPES procedures can also be applied um, at outside IPES in a way, uh, or customized to be applied outside IPES. And the IPES um, guide is also to some extent uh, catering for that by uh, providing some more sort of generic uh, guidance on how and how to go about uh, undertaking a national ecosystem assessments, for instance. Now, uh, if we look at the IPES assessment stages, they're basically, as in many other uh, assessments, um, basically four sort of key uh, key stages involved in the IPES uh, assessment process. The first one is really about sort of how to receive requests and explore uh, how an assessment could be undertaken. The second one looks at how to scope and design an assessment. The third one is really about implementation of the assessment and especially by the expert and and the last one the fourth one is about sort of how is uh, an assessment received how is it endo endorsed in this IPES system and 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 what does IPES do in terms of reaching out to, to those who might want to use the assessment so I'll quickly take you through um, a few of these steps First one, uh, on the re request for uh, an exploration of an IPES assessment, uh, in IPES it's really that those requests come from member states and from observers, from, for instance, the, uh, the multilateral environmental agreements that are uh, working on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And in IPES, it's really it sort of happened once that call for requested, and it was in the context of the development of the work program for 2014-2018. Uh, and those were requests were really considered by uh, the multidisciplinary uh, expert group and, and the Bureau in the development of the draft work program. And a number of the ideas that were submitted were also uh, scoped uh, in terms of scoping reports at an early stage. And the, um, the second plenary of IPES then considered uh, approving uh, this work program, uh, went through it, uh, altered it, to some extent, um, and actually initiated further scoping on, an, on, on the assessment it felt should be, uh, should be uh, considered further, and it initiated at least two assessments immediately, which was the one on pollination, and the, uh, which was a thematic assessment on pollination, and, and the one on uh, methodological assessment on scenarios and modeling. So, um, but later on, um, IPES has also then been uh, undertaking more uh, uh, detailed scoping uh, work, um, and notably on the regional assessments on land degradation and also on, on, on global uh, assessment. And those uh, scoping processes basically are initiated by uh, scoping is overseen by the MEP, supported by the Bureau, and also experts, uh, normally a physical expert meeting, but it also can happen as was the case for the invasive uh, alien species uh, um, scoping uh, through a web-based um, uh, consultation with experts. Um, this basically then always results in a draft uh, scoping report um, and that is really a, a key document because it sets out the rationale, the uh, uh, assumptions uh, behind the assessment, what is its utility, what is the availability of data, of knowledge, who are the partners, what is the, the, the spatial scale, what is the time scale, what is the chapter outline, what are the costs and well, what are the timeline. And, and this really happens uh, through a sort of standardized approach in IPES. Um, and, but if it is applied uh, outside the IPES uh, framework, uh, for instance by a government or any other uh, entity that would like to sort of scope and design a, a, an assessment, then these are the kind of issues that one would need to, to look at. Um, then what happens in the IPES uh, system is that um, the plenary considers this scoping report. 
um, it normally sort of goes through it fairly detailed, sort of section by sections, and also does alterations uh, of it. Um, and if the plenary is happy with the document, then it would uh, normally initiate an assessment. If not, it might actually want to rescope the doc uh, or ask the, the MEP to rescope the document. It might sort of say, "Well, the scoping is okay, but we we are uh, for other reasons perhaps putting uh, an assessment." on hold, uh, which is currently the case for the invasive alien species assessment because of resource constraints, um, but with the intention of revisiting the issue at the, at the next plenary, it uh, could also potentially reject uh, the, uh, the, um, the completion of an assessment. Um, but hasn't really done so yet, it's basically put things on hold. Um, the scoping document is really important because that is the message from the from the plenary to the uh, experts that will implement the assessment. So that really needs to uh, be specific enough to give guidance to the experts, but also not to be so specific that it uh, is a straitjacket. So the the balance there is is really important, but the. F what is really um, helps the uh, IPAS uh, process in, in, in this context is that there is already an involvement uh, of uh, experts in the scoping process and there is there is the dialogue between uh, the plenary and, um, and and the government representatives and observers there and the experts in terms of how to to make uh, um, and prepare a, a, a a scoping report which fulfills that need. Um, and the interesting thing I think was when we did uh, the scoping of the global assessment at the last plenary was that the plenary actually reduced the complexity a bit in the scoping document so as to give the uh, experts more leeway in, in how to to uh, to uh, organize some of the details in the in the chapters but still also strengthening some of the policy questions in order to give uh, better directions uh, to the experts as to sort of what are the critical issues to assess. Now, if we look at the implementation stage, um, what then happens in, in IPES is that um, uh, there is a call for expert nominations to member states and observers, and then uh, the experts are selected by MEP, uh, and that's really the co-chairs and the authors, and here's a really critical issue for, uh, for the both relevance and, and, and credibility and, and legitimacy of, of IPES is to make sure that that the expert selection reflects a balance between gender, between disciplines, between different knowledge systems, between uh, different parts of, of the world. And then uh, the MEP also sets up a management team, which basically is a co-chairs supported uh, by uh, some selected members from MEP and, and Bureau. And then the assessment expert gets going at uh, preparing a more detailed chapter outline, at preparing first and second order drafts, at making sure that uh, the drafts undergo peer review first by experts, then by um, then by experts and governments, and also develops a summary for uh, policy makers, which pulls out the uh, policy relevant findings for uh, for the policy makers. And I'll, I'll come back to to this a bit more. But let's look at the last uh, part of the uh, the last stage in the IPES assessment uh, process. Um, uh, and that is really a sort of a validation by the MEPAM Bureau uh, of uh, the assessment report and the summary for policymakers. And then through the MEPAM Bureau, uh, the uh, summary for policymakers and the report goes uh, to the plenary for consideration. And the summary for policymakers then undergo a line-by-line -line approval where the, they're really focused on the dialogue between uh, the co-chairs and, and, the, and the CLAs and, and the governments and the observers in making sure that um, the SPM really reflects uh, the findings of this assessment in, in, uh, in, in a way which is, is, is useful um, for, for policymakers. And I think this has now happened once or two times actually in, in IPES history and that was on both pollination and on, uh, on uh, scenarios and I think the, the, the um, experience so far has been really, really um, encouraging uh, and I think really interesting both from the perspective of the scientists that have been involved and also, and also government representatives. And then from there the um, 
assessment goes, uh, uh, findings will be submitted uh, to media, to uh, different um, entities around the world that are interested in, in acting on it, notably uh, governments and the, the uh, uh, multilateral environmental uh, agreements, for instance, uh, different institutions in the international domain. Um, and I don't want to go too much into that. Really what I'd like to sort of focus on is um, uh, now the sort of process uh, undertaken by experts. So um, just very quickly, sort of who's who in the, in the NIPNIS assessment without me sort of going too much into detail. So the, the case players here are really the assessment co-chairs which are, are really overseeing the process. And then we have a set of coordinating lead authors that are coordinating each of the chapters and making sure that uh, they perform to the high standards uh, of, of IPES. And then there are lead authors which uh, are producing the sort of designated sections and parts of the chapters and then the contributing authors that, that chip in with more sort of technical information. Um, furthermore, uh, there are review editors that are overseeing the review process. There are expert reviewers which are undertaking uh, the review. Um, and then all the assessments uh, basically have a technical support unit which is providing technical and administrative support uh, uh, under supervision by the IPES Secretariat. Early in the uh, implementation stage, um, the uh, uh, management team and, and the authors would often focus on a sort of a, a sort of a more like a preliminary assessment of the of the areas that um, that the assessment would focus on. Perhaps uh, look at sort of how to do uh, a, a review of literature, um, and then the more detailed outline of the scoping, looking at the status and trends, scenarios, evaluation, and analysis of, of response options. Then um, uh, it's also really key to sort of figure out how to uh, access the uh, material uh, that are available around the world. Where are they actually? Uh, where are the global data sets? Uh, where are the regional and sub-regional data sets, uh, how uh, do we best uh, engage with the ILK knowledge um, and how do we enter into the dialogue uh, with uh, expertise from other knowledge systems uh, and uh, IPES is developing procedures for how to do that now. Um, one uh, important source of information is the catalog on assessment that IPES has, uh, has been developed and which is hosted by UNEP WCMC. There is a link uh, to uh, the site uh, and it, it contains both global and, and national assessments on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, then um, the assessment uh, by the experts is really the cr a, a critical uh, a, a critical element of the uh, of of the IPES, um, and that is that is where uh, IPES relies on world leading expertise to to undertake a critical evaluation of the state of knowledge uh, in the areas that have been identified by the IPES plenary. So it's really not doing research. It's it's not limited to a structured literature review, but it is an analysis. It's a synthesis. It's a critical judgment of peer reviewed literature, of great literature, and of uh, information from other knowledge systems such as ILK. Um, and one key element here is also to try to quantify the level of confidence in an unbiased way, sort of what uh, what level of evidence do we have and, and what are the range of views. So it's really looking at the often vast amount of information out there and do a critical analysis of, of what this means. And then, of course, the second element here is really to present those findings uh, to the plenary uh, and pull out the, and substantiate the policy relevant findings in, in this summary for policymakers. And that should um, not be an abstract, really. It is really a synthesis of the findings of relevance to, to the actions required by policy and decision makers. Also important to, to identify knowledge gaps where they are, but since this is done by, to a large extent, uh, scientists and, and people working in the knowledge domain, it should also not be self-serving. Um, and then uh, it should 
be policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. Uh, so it's looking at sort of possible actions. So if we do X, then knowledge points us in the outcome Y under set circumstances is the kind of way of, of trying to, to phrase this. In terms of use of confidence terms, uh, I think we also might come, want to come back to this uh, in, 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 in later webinars. But this is basically to, to give you a, a sort of quick um, uh, quick sort of uh, uh, flash up basically the what these terms are it's uh, the well established the, the assessment uh, um, where um, we know that uh, there are comprehensive meta analysis or other synthesis, synthesis that's uh, really uh, there are multiple independent studies which show a finding, so the, that's an area where it's really well established. There could be others which are more sort of established but incomplete, some that are unresolved, and the last one is really inconclusive, where there's uh, not really a, a, a quantity or quality of, of evidence, uh, and there's not any much level of agreement. In, in up until the last plenary, IPES was actually referring to this as speculative, but in the plenary it was really felt that speculative is not something that IPES should deal with. We shouldn't really report on speculative issues, so that's also why this now has been changed. So this slide is slightly different from actually what you'll find on user confidence terms in the assessment guide, but it also goes to show that IPES doesn't stand still, it's constantly evolving. There are some lessons from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and other assessments when, uh, when an expert does uh, analyze the state of knowledge. It's kind of discussion of problems and action first. It's focusing on uh, uh, definable measures and action and avoid uh, sort of passive voice. It's also to not use value-laden flurry or, or colloquial language. Try, really try to avoid that. The IPES peer review process is really critical to the credibility and relevance of an assessment, uh, and it normally consists of three straight stages. Um, one is, as I mentioned, by ex experts, but it also later on involves governments uh, and experts jointly, and governments uh, also would review the policy SPM uh, really thoroughly. Uh, the critical thing here is to include a range of assessment users, a range of experts, and it, it's really helping to provide both guidance, it's ensuring robustness, it's offering new perspectives, it's augmenting results, it's adding legitimacy, it's, it's creating buy-in into the findings as well, because it involves a, a large amount of, of experts outside the IPES process. So the review process really sort of focuses on, on, on three key elements. Um, it's uh, the independent representation, it's uh, the preeminent expert advice, and it's the transparency and openness about the process. And more information about how to go about uh, the peer review process is also contained in the, uh, in, in the, um, in the guide. It's really led by the, the CLAs with guidance from, uh, from the review editors and authors are responsible for dealing with the reviews of the section. The responses are really uh, have to be recorded for future reference and, and consultations with the uh, review editors. Controversial issues should be highlighted uh, to the co-chairs and the use of, of, of the um, um, review editors are really critical in terms of helping and, and guiding uh, the review process. Now, um, I'd just like to sort of conclude my presentation with uh, uh, two quick slides on the SPM. I know that uh, some of the authors that uh, are uh, attending um, our uh, webinar will very soon be sort of uh, starting on the um, on developing uh, an SPM for some of the assessments they are involved in. So the key thing then to, to think about is sort of what is the sort of macro storyline and structure for, for, uh, for this summary. Um, and then uh, to try to sort of pre present the sort of macro story in the sort of two-page sort of uh, 
really sort of key findings, short, succinct, where one lets the facts tell the story mainly. And that is quite a, a challenge to write uh, a summary like that. Then the next thing is actually to back it up by a more detailed summary, which in Ipes we are trying to keep really short. Uh, I think it's some 10, 10 pages plus and with good illustrations, good graphs, uh, um, and again letting the facts tell the story. And the way it's done is by presenting the main message in bolded first sentence of a paragraph and then to substantiate, um, give examples, to present the level of confidence as we talked about is really critical uh, where it is appropriate and also in this uh, SPM to, to show and to, 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 to demonstrate sort of where these findings are to be are, are stem from in the main assessment so we need to be able to trace the findings back. So it's really an, an iterative process. Um, which involve often, very often, going forth and back between the SPM and the main report. It kind of starts with the, the first order draft. It's uh, with the, it, their sort of executive summaries, which really should not be an abstract, but a, a real summary of the findings. After the first peer review, then one develops the second order draft and uh, revises the executive summaries. And then it's when things are mature enough to try to start pulling things together into a summary for policymakers. And when one do that, one very often realizes that uh, there are things that are probably are, are not sort of um, attended, necessarily attended uh, properly to in the, in the uh, underlying chapters, so there might be a need to go back and forth between the, the the chapters and the SPM and the executive summaries. And that sort of through that iterative process uh, actually not only helps pulling out the, the policy relevant findings of an assessment, but it also helps shape uh, the main report when it travels through these different uh, uh, review processes and stages into the plenary for a line-by-line -line approval of the SPM and an acceptance of uh, the main report. And uh, when that has happened in the NIPES, then uh, the uh, assessment process is concluded and that actually concludes my presentation. So I'll hand back to you, Hoko. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Eva. A very interesting overview of the IPBS assessment process. Uh, as we said initially, we'll, we will now have a facilitated Q&A session answering submitted questions. Jumping to the first question, uh, we have uh, a question here from one of the attendees on national governments and the international statistical community. How does IPBS suggest engaging national governments and the international statistical community? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think there's a lot of work going on also right now in, in, uh, in terms of work on, on, on indicators and reporting to the, on, on work for the sustainable development goals, which just have been concluded uh, by the United Nations. And, um, and of course, IPES is also within its, uh, within its mandate, uh, without, without sort of going beyond its mandate, uh, also uh, through its own assessment trying to contribute to the knowledge base for both the ACHI targets of the CBD and, and, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so there's a, a, a well of information, an upwelling of information in, in many ways in this area, uh, coming from governments, coming from um, institutions, that's statistical uh, offices around the world. And, and what IPES needs to do is to try to tap into that uh, information. But as we looked at, IPES is really sort of looking at published literature, uh, great literature, so it, it really has to be uh, reported and available in, in the public domain for IPES to, to utilize it. But also I think IPES findings uh, may, may sort of point to sort of where there is a need for further work, work further knowledge generation, um, information that is needed for, 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 uh, for indicators, for instance, um, and also areas uh, uh, where um, there is a need for 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 action uh, based on 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 what the available information tells us. So I think there is again uh, here what IPES would 
like to to contribute to is, is a more of an, an iterative process uh, and, and working with the knowledge generation community and I think that is also something that perhaps we in, in later webinars could come back to and, and see how the task force on uh, data and knowledge is working with uh, other uh, knowledge generation com communities uh, in making sure that uh, IPES actually contributes to their uh, agenda and we from the IPES side also manage to capitalize fully on what uh, uh, the knowledge generation community is, 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 is producing. Thank you Ivar. Uh, the second question today relates to how the process on data reception and validation by experts could you elaborate a bit on how this process is done and maybe especially focusing on indicator species? Well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not really a specialist in, in, uh, in indicator species, um, uh, but uh, again, I think the, the key thing from the IPES side is to mobilize those as experts. It's to mobilize the experts from different disciplines that, that know how to, uh, where to find uh, the, the, the data, how to validate it, how to judge it. So uh, the IPES assessment process is really about um, mobilizing, first of all, the nomination of, of experts from around the different disciplines. And one of the key challenges that IPES have, uh, have encountered is also to mobilize uh, expertise from the social science domain. So we need experts from, from both natural sciences and from social sciences, from different knowledge systems that are able to, to, to do the judgment call on sort of what, uh, what does the published literature, what does the published data tell us. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I, I, w I would need to leave it at that from, from my perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have someone asking, to what extent does IPBS work and especially assessments integrate resilience thinking? Can you give examples? Yeah, again, I think uh, um, if you look at, I think this is perhaps also something that uh, Sandra Diaz uh, might attend a bit more to when she um, presents the conceptual framework, which is really sort of the analytical approach to understanding what is happening with the biodiversity of the world, what implications that have for the ecosystem services that we depend on and, and, and other benefits that we, we draw on. Um, so uh, the resilience approach is, is sort of uh, one uh, way of looking at um, that uh, analysis and it's, uh, it's, it's I think an, uh, an approach which has gotten a lot of traction. Um, and I think, again, it is for um, IPES to mobilize a broad set of experts which, which can um, analyze uh, what the current literature, what the current uh, data in this area is telling us. Thank you. Uh, another attendee is wondering what the criteria for global evaluation of biodiverse, biodiversity and ecosystem services are. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, that's also an interesting thing, actually, because when we looked at, um, what, you know, then perhaps it also illustrates the point whether when we sort of IPES was a, um, was um, established in late 2012, we used 2013 to develop the work program and and also a lot of the procedures, and we started then in in in, in 2014-15 and now early 2016 to implement all this, but then we also realized. Um, that uh, we obviously haven't, we've, we've thought of a lot of things, but we haven't thought of everything. And, and one thing which is currently under consideration, and, and especially in, in, uh, in, in conjunction with uh, the implementation of the regional assessments, is also um, a, a IPES own approach to a classification of ecosystem services. It's done before uh, by, for instance, the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Um, it's also really attended to by the by the TEAB the, um, on, on ecosystem um, uh, benefits. Um, so there are, there are a number of approaches out there, but IPES needs to come up with its own approach, and that that is actually um, to some extent also dealt within um, in the valuation uh, guidelines. Um, but there are also work going on as we speak, actually, uh, on sort of how IPES is approaching the the ecosystem services uh, classification, and and how um, 
how it is looks at at at, uh, at these benefits, uh, which are so important for uh, for long term human well being um, and for for sustainable development in society. Okay, thanks. Uh, one topic that is spurring some interest uh, amongst our attendees is the thematic assessment on invasive species. Could you elaborate on what's going on now and and what the, the next steps are? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, so there are a number of assessments um, initiated, obviously, but in the work program there are uh, also several assessments uh, that have not yet been initiated, and one of them um, is the one of invasive species, uh, and that um, was uh, successfully um, scoped uh, during. Um, a process last year which involved um, a web um, uh, exchange among experts and, and I think that in itself was a very uh, useful experience um, trying to sort of work again electronically um, on, on uh, a, a key issue like invasive species um, and the scoping uh, document the scoping report for that assessment was approved by the plenary um, in uh, Kuala Lumpur in um, in February now the challenge for IPES though is that uh, the plenary found that we do not have uh, the necessary resources to to start the initiation or to start the implementation of that assessment right now so it has been put on hold and partly it's a, it's it's a, a question of um, financial resources in, in the trust fund uh, but partly it's also a, a question of the of the um, uh, of the resources uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, of uh, personnel uh, in 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 both uh, in, in in both sort of elected and 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 uh, hired uh, experts that are working in, in IPES, i.e. the the secretariat and the bureau and the map and uh, and the whole uh, system that is supporting IPES. Um, there are also other uh, assessments that have been put on hold a little bit, uh, which is also the one on on, on evaluation, and then uh, the assessment on. Um, on, on um, sustainable use is uh, is uh, has been authorized for for rescoping. Okay. Uh, did you have something more to add? No thanks. That no. was uh, the main okay. thing. Yeah, I, I will uh, will try to fit in a couple of more questions before we we end. Uh, we have someone asking what will happen with the drafts made by the authors in the ongoing assessments and can you also say something about the workload on the planned global assessment? Yeah, the global assessment, let me, let me start, start there, there is, is really a key undertaking for uh, IPES. Um, it is uh, an assessment which will in a way draw together a lot of the work that has been taking place on until now and that are uh, taking place so it will draw on the uh, the uh, thematic assessments on pollination the one that has been uh, been initiated on land degradation and uh, not the least it will draw on the um, on the regional assessments and and also uh, pull uh, some of the, of the key findings from those assessments together um, also it it uh, it, it Puts together uh, and and draws on uh, the work uh, being done in, in the scenarios uh, and uh, and um, modeling because the global assessment really um, uh, is is drawing on the the guidance that has come from that methodological assessment on scenarios and models. Um, furthermore, it, it it will build on the work in, in values. It will build on the work in, in policy support. It will also be an important um, uh, process for uh, uh, for building further capacity, um, but last but not least, it's really um, timed so that it would um, provide uh, a knowledge foundation for uh, any further consideration by the conference of parties under the Convention of Biodiversity on uh, renewal of the Archie Parks on Biodiversity, 
it is also very well placed to contribute uh, as a part of the knowledge of the sustainable development goals. Um, when it comes to sort of what will happen sort of with the draft, I think I've tried to um, explain a little bit uh, how the drafts actually of the different assessment travels through um, different sequences and through the different uh, uh, reviews and, and how that sequencing is really important uh, for the analysis, uh, the critical analysis of, of the state of knowledge. So. A draft is a draft, but it's uh, um, not only a draft. It is a it, it's a step in a, in, in a very deliberate uh, assessment process. Okay, wonderful. I'm afraid that we have now spent all the time allotted for this session, so we will have a quick wrap up for today. Thank you for joining us and for all of the interesting questions submitted to Eva. We apologize for not being able to cover all of these questions during today's session but we will draw on the input we have received from your questions in planning future webinars in the series. If you would like to download the PDF version of this presentation, it has been made available for you in the GoToWebinar interface under Handouts. If you would like to watch this webinar again or recommend it to someone else, the webinar recording will be posted on ipbs.net. I would like to remind you that we will host a second webinar in this series on Thursday, April 28th, at 6 to 7 p.m. Central European Summer Time. In that webinar, we will be joined by Professor Sandra Diaz, who will talk about the IPBS conceptual framework. More information about the webinar and registration will be forthcoming on IPBS.net, as well as via email. I would also like to remind you that as we are in the process of piloting the IPBS webinar series, we would greatly appreciate it if you could complete a survey about the webinar. The survey will pop up on your screen once you exit the webinar and will take approximately two minutes to complete. With that, let me say thank you again, Eva, for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for everyone who have attended the webinar. We look forward to having you again. Goodbye. <laughs>